Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 21st of March 2024. Very busy day ahead for me. I am speaking to you guys, speaking to you guys, doing a live to speak to you guys, speaking to you guys and then speaking to you guys, uh, and then probably go to sleep. So let's get on with it. Uh, let's go to where we normally start Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before all the usual caveats apply you can find those in the description to the video below and we are continuing sort of with the trends that we saw that we have seen over the last couple of days which is fewer things getting blown up and fewer personnel being lost I think that's going to be partly as I've mentioned several times before to do with the elections being over so no pressure to take uh, land for the Russians the mud season is in full flow um, potential culmination of the Russian forces as well. 750 personnel is still uh, a decent statistic. Remember, these are human beings. Uh, for the Ukrainians, four tanks, very low, comparatively speaking. 16 APVs is about average. Uh, 26 artillery systems is above average for the whole length of the war. One multiple launch rocket system, 44 vehicles and fuel tanks, and three pieces of special equipment. So a few of those categories, fairly uh, considerable, 44 vehicles and fuel tanks particularly, 26 artillery systems is quite useful, but uh, generally lower than we have seen. When we come to Andrew Perpetua's lost statistics for uh, what he sees and his team sees on the socials, we can see that Russians have lost a vast number of bits of kit that, uh, makes the ratio probably about three or four to one in the in the favor of the Ukrainians. Uh, that's Russian losses to Ukrainian losses. That's a really good statistic. And when we look at the uh, the list of Ukrainian bits of kit, there is uh, a plane damage, an Aero L thirty nine Albatross uh, by Lancet. Unsure how damaged that is, but we'll, we'll show that in a second. There's a worrying trend concerning targets in that coastal area of the northwest of the Black Sea. And I think this is a, a, a real problem for the Ukrainians. Anyway, uh, a number of comms towers and surveillance bits of kit damaged by Russian ATGMs, anti-tank guided missiles. El Kolchuga M uh, destroyed by Lancer or damaged by Lancer. That's a radar system. That's in that same general area as well. Uh, that that is a problem. We've got evacuation robot. I've got footage of that um, destroyed by a Russian FPV drone and some artillery and tanks. Leopard two A four, unknown cause and date, potentially related to October the twenty sixth video. So that could be a long time ago for that Leopard two A four and a Bradley as well. So a few bits of kit. There's actually a lot more uh, worry about as I say, this area of the northwest of the Black Sea, particularly with the number of boats, we've got a third bit of footage of a boat or even ship um, damaged by Russian drones that are really able to get into areas that they shouldn't do. Right, as far as Russian equipment lost, there's a number of engineering vehicles, excavators. There was a, a bit of footage, as you can see there, a montage of Russian excavators getting hammered. Uh, so we've got sort of eight of those damaged at the top of the list. A couple of bits of um, artillery. And then Mr. S, I think that that's the self-propelled version of the Mr. B. Um, and then a number of tanks, including a T-90M being damaged. That's the, uh, the, the best Russian tank there is, really. T-72s, T-62s, T-80s as well thrown in there. And then another huge list of infantry fighting vehicles taken out predominantly by FPV drones. I say predominantly, I think, <clears throat> entirely, apart from one unknown cause there. So that's a massive list of infantry fighting vehicles again, half of which are destroyed or abandoned. Uh, so only, a, only a, a, well, less than half actually damaged. Uh, so that's a good haul for the Ukrainians. And then APCs, most of which are dam uh, destroyed, sorry, including BTRs, MTLBs and uh, whatnot. So then we have trucks, a lot of Desert Cross 1003. So those are the golf carts. 
the fact that we are seeing in a single day seven of those being destroyed mainly, uh, that shows that the Russians are using them more. And the question is, are they using them because it's good to use them or are they using them because they've got no other uh, alternative? And given the number of infantry fighting vehicles they're losing, there's no surprise that they are using Desert Cross 1000s. And I don't know how sustainable these kind of losses are for the Russians. Now, some of this might have come out from just montages that, that don't necessarily... Uh, signify losses from the last 24 hours but these might be losses over a week or two from a unit providing uh, that data there's also uh, Andrew was in his live stream the other night was talking about seeing a bit of footage of 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 an attack near Nova Mikulivka that showed another 10 destroyed vehicles that they had they didn't know about that hadn't been not only geolocated, it just there was no footage of that before. So suddenly you can sometimes get these a uh, bit of footage that highlights ten uh, other destroyed vehicles. You don't necessarily know how they were destroyed either because you don't have the, like the live footage of them being destroyed, if you like. Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot of uh, destruction taking place. But where it, where it comes to the Ukrainians, I just think they're losing some fairly high value kit. Now here's one uh, of the bits of footage of the ship here. Third video in a few days of Lancets hitting Ukrainian patrol boats at notable distances of 50 plus kilometers. This one could be a Sea Guard Stenker class alongside near Yuzhny. Uh, one of the early videos showed an island class hit near Mikhailiv, which I showed you that was in a river. Uh, and there you can see this is a direct hit on top. Don't know how much damage was done. You can see the people on the uh, on the pier there. Uh, this is this is a, such a challenge. Uh, for the Ukrainians, the fact that so far behind the lines, and we'll, we'll just throw that geolocation, so far behind the lines, you've got Dnipro over here, uh, uh, the Ukrainians are just being hit by these drones, you've got, you know, on the way to Odessa down there, and this should be such a, a highly protected area. Um, in terms of drones and missiles, reconnaissance drones, as, as much as Shahids and whatnot. Sh Odessa is getting hammered routinely, and it has some really important port infrastructure that you would you would think that the Ukrainians have their top you know, defences around, but it appears that, that this l larger area is still able to be penetrated uh, by the Russian reconnaissance drones and their, therefore by their lancets and whatnot that, that have fairly decent ranges uh, as mentioned here reported that a lancet hit an st68u radar as well east of yuzne in the odessa region so that's east of that port that you just saw uh, so that was exactly where the that boat was hit we've got also a radar system being hit so although i say they should have the best radar defenses well they have a decent radar there but it but still this is hit by a lancet and that's the sorry that's the radar here the Kolchuga M uh, hit by the lancet so this is just you know a real headache for the Ukrainians um let's just get back to where we were this is what uh and and that's where it is it's, it's just there um and that gets hit this is a passive sensor a Kolchuga passive sensor is an electronic warfare support measure, ESM, system developed in the Soviet Union manufactured in Ukraine. Its detection range is limited by uh, line of sight, but maybe up to 800 kilometers for very high altitude. Obviously, this is going to be why it's near the sea, so nothing gets in the way. Um, very powerful, um, uh, high altitude, very powerful emitters. Frequently referred to as a Kolchuga radar, the system is not really a radar, but an ESM system comprising three or four receivers deployed tens of kilometers apart, which detect the track and track aircraft by triangulation and multilateration of their RF emissions, whatever that means. So that is, uh, okay, it's not like the newest bit of kit, but it that is a, uh, it's a highly uh, valuable, valuable bit of kit that's been taken out by that lancet and then we have what's initially reported here is an uh, su-25 actually it's the l-39 which is a training aircraft uh, i think provided by is it the czechs provided these russians targeted uh, it with a lancet again uh, i haven't got a single clue the lancet penetrated the tent or not and this is the one that andrew perpetua put as damage in my opinion what we see burning is the ceiling of the tent and not the actual 
aircraft. Um, and yeah, this has happened where? Well, and again, at the, uh, near to where we're talking about, this time in Mikolaiv, at the airport near Mikolaiv, uh, where we've seen previously airplanes get targeted going back months, again with uh, Lancet drones as well. So they're still able to get Lancets to places they really shouldn't. And it shows you how prevalent this problem is. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's what the Russians are doing there in that neck of the woods. Here we have a Ukrainian drone with automatic homing hitting a Russian tank in the Donetsk region. Uh, in fact, this is not the only bit of um, footage we have of a similar... Uh, here we have another one. I presume this is another one uh, because I think this takes out a, yeah, a grad launcher. So an FPV drone with an automatic guidance system destroying a Russian uh, BM-21 grad multiple launch rocket system and hitting another vehicle as well. So there's, we're starting to see a development of drones where they are able to take out targets using automatic uh, guidance and automatic targeting systems. Um, moving on, we have the Russians. There's some footage of a Russian sort of running up to this Abrams tank, which has been, uh, I guess, well, not destroyed, but it's been abandoned due to being damaged in it immobile, I presume in the Padici area by Avdivka. As David Dees here says, this tank took a tremendous beating. No telling what it gave to the bad guys prior to losing its track and becoming a mobility kill. Uh, but once inside the tank, they found this. Not a single round made it past the armour. The crew was not hurt and were able to get out unharmed. And from the looks of it, they were able to fire the main gun ammo prior to leaving the tank. Amazing, send more M1s. Uh, there is a lot of call for the US to send. They've got... They've got how many? Is it 6,000 of these? Well, some huge number of them. And they could easily send more than 31 and a half cents. Of course, it all depends on Congress. Um, and that's not looking like it's going anywhere soon. But this looks like pretty good protocol of... Well, you sh you'd argue that they should th be throwing some uh, hand grenades down the hatch to, to blow out the interior. So that's probably what should have happened. They might not want to. They might have thought it was recoverable. Um, but in the end, the Russians have, uh, have got hold of it. Uh, but they did fire off all the ammo, which would include probably de depleted uranium ammo, possibly on, on board. But nonetheless, it has withstood, apparently, uh, quite a bit. And is n no Russian rounds penetrated, which is incredibly significant. Uh, here we have a footage of a Russian guy <laughs> looking at his poor sunken armored personnel carrier. There. A lone surviving Russian soldier contemplates life choices after his entire APC crew is drowned under fire. This is a group of 10 armored vehicles. Eight were destroyed by Ukrainian drones. One escaped and one drowned. Just quite incredible. And actually, some of this is caught on, on camera. This, I believe this is the drone as it uh, comes down that that side and and go not the drone it's the apc as it comes down here and falls into the water uh and then there's also another uh, vehicle getting stuck in a trench which um yeah so that's the drone going down getting stuck in there and your man getting out and then just over here a this this uh, vehicle gets stuck in a trench it's got lots of people on top they all fall off and on the front i don't know if some of them uh have an unfortunate tumble in front of the machine or not and and uh are injured or perish I, i'm not can quite work it out I, I won't continue playing but this is another vehicle getting stuck in a trench so it's basically rendered inoperable because it's driven into a trench now this is a russian one part of that same footage I presume part of that same attack where they lose best part of um what is it 10 vehicles with only one escaping um uh so here we see a russian vehicle getting stuck in a trench but actually this is happening to both sides and it's happening quite a lot vehicles driving into craters i've talked to you to, to you about this before the window for driving and these there's a lot of electronic stuff inside of course 
to help you with visuals and whatnot. Or it depends actually. In some of these old vehicles, not so much. So you, you have these very small windows, and that gives you uh, a line of sight that makes it quite difficult. I would have thought to work out whether you, you know you can see straight forward and you see right that looks like straight ground, but if there's a sudden dip and then comes up again like a crater then you might not be able to see that. So you're thinking, well, it looks straight. Uh, again, you know, the, the visuals aren't great. And so looking for things like mines is going to be particularly difficult, which is why you have someone sat on top, possibly. Um, but, but here, you didn't see the crater or the trench, or maybe did and just miscalculated. But quite often, I don't think they see, see craters and we are seeing both sides drive vehicles into craters and not be able to get them out and then having to abandon the vehicle. And you're thinking, what an absolute waste. So, so frustrating, especially, you know, when those are Ukrainian vehicles. And this is the first confirmed loss of a Ukrainian, very likely a German delivered UGV. So it's an unmanned ground vehicle. Basically, it's this thing here. Uh, they can come in different shapes and uh, sizes. You know, here's one that can carry, I guess, ammunition or people on a stretcher or whatever, or both. Um, this one has a crane on it pulling a um, a trailer. So this is the first recorded destruction of one of these. Uh, it's a Themis UGV. Germany donated 14 of these, seven Kazovac and seven as route clearance configuration with payloads from French defence manufacturer CNIM Système Industriel. Uh, very bad accent. Um, so yeah, the, that's something else that has uh, taken one for the team. Right, moving on to distant strikes. Now, the first thing to note of last night is that there was a, a the first big missile uh, barrage that we've seen in a long time. In fact, the other day I reported it had been 38 days since one of these had been sent. And that talks a lot about, um, again, as I keep saying, you would if you could, you aren't, so you can't. So it means that they either don't have the missiles or they don't have the capability of sending these missiles. And actually, I think it's a bit of both. So uh, we, we, saw, we knew this was going to happen earlier because as soon as those planes take off in Russia, everyone knows about it. So everyone's like, right, the 295s have taken off and whatnot. We know there's going to be a missile strike. And lo and behold, there was a, there was a missile strike. So 31 missiles were sent, I think. And 29 KH-101 uh, cruise missiles. And then Kinjal, one Kinjal hypersonic missile and one Iskander-M was sent and all 31 were taken down. So this is really successful. I think they were all pretty much sent against Kiev and they were all taken down by Kiev's air defences, which is really good news. Obviously, that's going to exhaust Ukraine's air defences, but also it's going to exhaust the stockpiles of Russian missiles. And I think the cost for this is something like $300 million plus the fuel and operational costs of flying those air, air, aircraft back and forth. Um, as a result of them getting shot down, though, there was quite a bit of damage done to Kiev in terms of houses, cars, roads, falling debris and whatnot. But all the missiles were shot down. Um, no signs of catastrophic damage. Really good news for the Ukrainians. The early morning attack, as mentioned here, would have cost $300 million in missiles alone. So far, 10 injuries are known of, so shrapnel damage and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, although there's quite a bit of damage seen here that this isn't the missiles hitting uh, their intended targets this is this is but still what goes up must come down and that does cause really uh, annoying damage obviously to the uh, to wherever they land so injury tolls up to 13 including a child remarkably for such a heavy attack no one was killed as far as we know so that's, um, I think, testament to the air defences around Kiev. But the other component, and maybe so, not having the production capacities of these missiles that the Russians would like, and so that could be why they aren't sending these repeated barrages like they had done previously. But also this quote: "No Russian ships were involved in this morning missile. This morning's missile attack. They have been at base." for two weeks, some even for a month already, says 
uh, Natalia Humenu, the spokeswoman for the Operational Command South. Now, the, wow, this is so important that the Russians aren't using like one of their main uh, capabilities for launching cruise missiles into Ukraine because they're too afraid to leave the ports of Sevastopol or Novorossiysk is phenomenal. That is a massive victory for the Ukrainians. And as long as the Ukrainians can keep the Russians penned in like this, then they might as well not have those ships. Of course, the Russians are going to be trying to adapt. We heard that Shoigu came to Sevastopol and said, right, you need heavy machine guns on the side of boat, the ships. You need to build them now and get your people trained up on them. And they need to be able to shoot directly downwards so they can shoot these drones, these naval drones. Um, and you can rest assured that they'll be trying to work out ways of getting around this using other, I don't know, mechanisms or protocols or, or, or whatnot. So the Ukrainians, this is going to be that cat and mouse game. The Ukrainians are going to want to keep those vessels in Sevastopol and in Novorossiysk unable to cause havoc um, by launching these missiles into Ukraine. Now, going further afield, Belgorod is under a lot of... Um, well, there's a lot of missile attention. Never quite sure whether it's air defences or Ukrainian missiles. Civil war continues in Russia, says Tim White, particularly in Belgorod Oblast. It's a loud start to the day in a region that borders Ukraine. The Belgorod arena has been damaged in this morning's shelling. I remember reading pages and pages of Belgorod residents laughing when rockets launched from their region hit Kharkiv. Everyone remember, not a single missile needed to be fired. Russia did not need to invade. It's a really interesting point there, actually. I saw yesterday some videos from the beginning, from like February 2022, of Russians in, I think, Belgrade, dancing in the street with missiles being sent off in the night sky behind them, literally dancing because Russia was sending missiles into Ukraine, into civilian infrastructure in Kharkiv, right? I wonder whether those same people are dancing now. They've probably been mobilised and sent to the front line and don't no longer live. But, you know, I don't know the value of what's going on here and I don't even know whether it's air defences or, or Ukrainian missiles. There are, there are claims from the Russians that they are shooting down these uh, vampire, like Russia's claiming it shot down 10 vampire MLRS shells in the attack at 8 a.m. this morning. So if they're shooting these down in Belgorod, then that's going to be air defences. The question is, where? what were the targets for those multiple launch rockets if that was indeed the case? So I, 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 the whole thing in north of the border there, I am just really torn about. I don't, I don't really know whether it's being successful or not, and whether it's you know an ill-advised um, attack by the free Russia troops that you know are doing that in coordination with the Ukrainians. So it's not if the Ukrainians didn't want that to happen, it wouldn't be happening. The equipment is provided by the Ukrainians. So it's not like it's these people operating completely on their own. Um, now, yes, if you remember, there's a, a, a big strike using an anti-ship missile on Kharkiv. These are missiles that are very hard to shoot down, but it just seems to have slammed into the regional prosecutor's office. So this is basically uh, civilian infrastructure, um, not not a particularly high-value military target. Again, it tells you what the Russians are like. I don't know whether that is in retaliation for that which is going on across the border. It's likely. Um, fire broke out across the top of that building. And indeed, Greg Terry was on the scene pretty much as soon as it had happened and did a live uh, feed from there, um, you know, giving you an idea of what goes on as soon as these incidents take place. Um, Russia used a KH-35 anti-ship missile in an attack on Kharkiv on March 20th that killed five civilians, calling to Vladimir Timoshko, the head of the National Police in Kharkiv Oblast. And then it was attacked for a second time. I don't know any details about that, but it was attacked later in the day as well. Explosions were heard in the city again. Um, and then Sumy has been thoroughly bombarded. Uh, Sumy Oblast, uh, which is to the south of Kursk Oblast, I think. Um, this has had quite a lot of work, a huge amount of attention from aviation bombs that are absolutely littering the Oblast. 
I think there was in one day, was it 340 uh, along there? Or was that 340 that they've had this month? Like some huge number of, um, of aviation bombs have been raining down on Sumi Oblast. Um, so that could well be, almost certainly, is in retaliation f to the uh, activities going on north of the border there with the free Russian units. Right. Russian telegram channel Fighter Bomber, which is close to Russia's airport, says said last night that Ky Kyiv's got effed for Belgorod, and this is good. So this is the, uh, at least from this source, the understanding that the the barrage of missiles sent against Kyiv last night was in retaliation for that which is going on in Belgorod. So if you're linking the behaviour of the, the free Russian fighters to this then the the question is what well, is what they are doing worth it okay that so here 31 missiles were shot down so that's good news but as we as we come to look now freedom and russia legion yep still look like they are in control of gogovsky Gugovsk, possibly or at least somewhere they are evidently alive somewhere around there how much of the place they control i don't know and it's quite difficult to work out exactly what's going on but it does seem, I mean, Andrew Perpetua is really stinging in his appraisal of, of what these guys are doing and what they're achieving. He's making a point that the number of pieces of equipment they've lost outstrips the amount of equipment they've taken out of the Russians. Uh, now, that could be because it's that's what happens when you initially go on the attack. We've seen this from every time the Russians attack at the moment. But can you then get a foothold and then build on that to, to I don't know, to produce something that's more worthy, more worthwhile? Uh, will they attract the Russian troops like uh, they are hoping? It, it appears that, that that's one of their intentions. There are some claims from the Russians that they are going to send elite troops there. And if they are sending elite troops there, then that is kind of one of the success criteria. As I say, one thinks those elite troops are going to be brought from operating somewhere else, which then alleviates pressure on the front line elsewhere. Jay and Kiev here says, seems Ukraine's plan to bring the war into Russia from Ukraine is starting to do exactly what they wanted. Reports from Russia's side that troops will be transferred from the front back to Belgorod. More chaos in Belgorod this morning. People running around, obviously shells and, and things going on. Uh, but yeah, still undecided as to exactly what's going on there. And finally for this section and for this video, other bits and pieces here. Russia's torturing more Ukrainian POWs and sentences them en masse for to 27 years in prison for defending Ukraine. So just for, you know, they, they it's illegal to, to defend your own country from an aggressive invasion. So we're going to arrest you, torture you and keep you in prison for 27 years for defending your country. Uh, this is from Human Rights in Ukraine organization. Uh, that often has good details of, of what's taking place within the uh, the area of human rights and POWs and torture and whatnot. Russia staged another mass tri trial in scare quotes. Every time they say trial, they put it in scare quotes. Uh, of Ukrainian prisoners of war sentencing 10 men to 26 to 27 years maximum security imprisonment. The new scare quotes sentences were passed by an unrecognized scare quotes court on occupied territory, with the claim that the men had shelled residential buildings, almost certainly based solely on, scare quotes, confessions, obtained from men held incommunicado and without access to independent lawyers. The, scare quotes, trial was reported post-fact by Russia's investigative committee, scare quotes as well, uh, just three days after a damning UN report detailing Russia's indiscriminate attacks on Ukrainian civilian targets and its systematic torture of Ukrainian prisoners of war. Talking about hitting civilian uh, targets, then we can go back to Kharkiv's strike yesterday. But of course, one has to then think about what's going on in Belgorod as well. What's what's being targeted there? We, we just don't know what's being targeted. We know that the missiles are being brought down within Belgorod. Anyway, you know, trying to be fair here. Virtually all of Russia's huge number of trials of Ukraine's POWs follow the same pattern. As, and the one announced on March the 18th was no exception. Although the Russian investigative committee claims it gathered, quote, scare quotes, the evidence, the supposed trial is reported to having taken place in the unrecognized high court of Russia's proxy Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, the 10 men are all identified as being from Ukraine's 
Azov Regiment, which most of the Russian state-controlled sources refer to as a nationalist regiment, although it is simply a part of the armed, Ukraine's armed forces, it certainly is these days. Uh, the men are alleged to have, during the period of 25th of February to 19th of March 2022, carried out indiscriminate shelling of residential buildings and civilian infrastructure in Stary Krim and Lebedinsk, uh, which Russian sources claim to be parts of DPR. Five homes were purportedly damaged, their owners, owners sustaining significant losses. However, nobody was hurt. The charges are essentially those that Russia always used for such trials. The men were accused of attempting murder of two or more people carried out by an organised group in a manner dangerous to the public and motivated by enmity and hostility towards a social group. Of course, using that, you know, criteria, um, and it continues, using prohibitive means and methods in an armed conflict and deliberate damage to others' properties through explosions causing considerable damage, you could arrest the entire Russian army and lock them up for 27 years. But I doubt the Ukrainians are going to lock them up for 27 years. But this is what Russia is doing. And then it goes on and talks about the, the prisoners of war protected status under inter international law and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, it is. That's it, what Russia do, I guess. Anyway, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, I really appreciate your support. Take care and I'll speak to you soon.